Well, tomorrow, as you know, is 4th of July, right? Anybody out there have any like family traditions that you do on the 4th of July? Anybody? Well, you guys really need to get, that was the same thing. First service, nobody's like, nope, we got nothing. All right, well, you ought to. That's kind of a neat thing to, to establish. But growing up, we had um, a family a tradition on the 4th of July. Every 4th of July, we'd get up uh, kind of early and uh, some friends of ours would come over to our house. And then together, we would go to uh, Pekin, Indiana to watch the 4th of July parade there. Anybody seen the 4th of July parade at Pekin? Pekin, a couple of you, all right? You ought to go. It's not that far, and it's actually the longest-running, continuous uh, 4th of July celebration in the whole country, um, and it's not too far away. But we would drive down there and watch this parade, um, and for a little kid, that was fun because there's lots of candy and all kinds of different things. But then, after that, we would get back in the car, and we, because uh, my mom and the other mom had packed a big picnic lunch, we would then drive to uh, Spring Mill State Park. Anybody been to Spring Mill State Park? All right, there we go. Now we got some participation. Good. We would drive to Spring Mill Park and we would have a picnic and we'd, you know, go exploring through the trails and uh, visit the mill and and all that kind of stuff. And that was kind of our fun uh, tradition. That's what we did for years and years. Uh, I remember that uh, growing up. After we um, first got married and Ron and I, in fact, it may have been our first 4th of July as a married um, couple, we had some friends over and we, um, you know, were just having fun, and so we had some sparklers, you know. Um, so we were running around, you know, the front yard, um, acting kind of crazy, and we thought it'd be a good idea. You know, we had some big bushes in our front yard. We kind of put one of the sparklers in there, and then from there we were lighting all the other sparklers, you know, and then running around uh, like crazy and not paying much attention. Well, it was pretty dry that year. Um, and as we were running around the front yard acting like uh, crazy people, we turned around and we had a recreation of a biblical scene right there, okay? If you don't know the Bible scene, there's this thing about the burning bush, all right? And we had it, all right? There was no voice from God saying, you know, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground or anything like that. But we had a burning bush. That was a tradition that uh, did not get started. It was, it was not good. Um, and so maybe you're... Uh, Memories of 4th of July are good. Maybe you've got some that didn't go uh, quite so well. Um, but at this time of year, um, it's kind of easy to feel good about our country. It's easy to feel you know, patriotic and, and have positive feelings. But like our uh, misadventure with the sparklers, it doesn't take long for us to realize that something in this great experiment called America has gone wrong. That things aren't exactly right. And people have different ideas, but if you've ever wondered, if you ever said, how is it that we got where we are? Or how did we end up here? How did things get like they are? That's kind of what we've been uh, talking about uh, last week and where we continue to talk about this week. Now, I mean, it's kind of frustrating because if you turn on the news, and especially with this, you know, election season going up, I mean, there's just lots of argument, lots of, I'd say discussion, but it's more argument of, you know, it's Republican versus Democrat or, you know, progressive versus conservative or big government versus big business or, you know, the rich versus the not as rich or, or whatever. And I think they missed the point um, a lot of times, but, but specifically, um, I think they missed the point because I think there's a greater, a deeper issue that really underlies all of those other things that get all the airplay. See, I happen to believe, as I said last week, that most of the issues that we see out in the culture, that they aren't primarily political issues or social issues. I happen to think that most of the issues that are out there are actually spiritual issues, that they intersect with what the Bible teaches. And so they are basically spiritual issues that have ramifications in the political and the social and the public arena. And so, as people who are trying to you know, be God followers and, and do things the way uh, Jesus would have us to do, I think we need to kind of step back and look at things through a biblical viewpoint rather than through a political viewpoint. And for some of us, that's really hard because we get so tied into our politics, but we have to step back and look from a biblical point of view. Because, as I said, I think there's an underlying current, an underlying conflict really that goes beyond uh, that all those other things are just symptoms of and as kind of we finished up last week what I told you what I thought was that conflict was it's the difference between people who are grateful and accountable to God and those who aren't grateful and accountable to God and the reason I came to that conclusion is because we talked about this whole idea of, of a conscience you have a conscience and I have a conscience but in that same way our nation has a conscience and back 240 years ago when the founders established this country the national conscience that they had was basically one of gratitude to and accountability to God they didn't all exa- believe exactly the same thing they weren't all exactly you know had the same theology or anything like that but they all understood that there was a God in heaven a creator God the God of the Bible 
to whom they were grateful to and to, at the end of the day, to whom we were all accountable to. And so, the, it, so much so that was woven into the fabric of our nation that even back in the 1950s, Congress got together and created a new national motto, which if you're here last week, you know is what? In God we trust, plus it's on the screen, that helps make it easier, right? That's where our country has been and that's uh, where it has been, but lately, and we, as we talked about last week, God has been kind of pushed out of the conversation. We've kind of pushed God uh, to the margins out of our conversation. And when we do that, when we push God to the side, it erodes our national conscience because our idea of conscience is tied in to God, the being grateful to him and being accountable, accountable to him. And when we push that to the side, then something else has to take its place. When our national conscience erodes, when there's no longer a consensus around what we should and shouldn't do, then more and more laws have to be put in place to tell us what we should and shouldn't do. And now, instead of our conscience or God informing our conscience, telling us what's right and wrong, what we end up with is a culture and a society where the courts tell us what's right and wrong. In that kind of a, a scenario, it basically means I'm not guilty until I'm caught or I'm not guilty unless I'm caught. In ancient China, they had a, a proverb that kind of said this, the mountain is high and the emperor is far away, right? I'm not guilty as long as nobody knows about it. And when you push God to the side, that's exactly what we get. When he, God goes to the margins of society, then law determines what is right rather than conscience. A perfect example of this happened just this past week uh, here uh, in our country. On Wednesday, uh, the Supreme Court, by a five to three vote, struck down Texas's House Bill 2, which, among other things, um, said that abortion providers had to have admitting privileges at local hospitals, which every other uh, surgery provider had to do, and also that um, abortion facilities had to have the same minimum requirements as any other outpatient surgery facility had to have. But that got voted down. And the response to that, and it's not my words, but it was right here on the front page of Wednesday's paper, this reporter and others like it said, and you can tell by the picture, you probably can't, but it's close, is that they celebrated, that people celebrated that restriction being taken away from being able to kill your own child. Because why? Because the court said it was okay, and so it was okay. Because law has replaced our conscience because God has been pushed to the side. Now, a lot of people are just uncomfortable with this whole idea of talking about religion and state putting, you know, getting mixed together. Especially, you look over in the Middle East and all the stuff that's happening over there, but not just over there that's bubbling up over into this country and all over um, the world. And people say, I'm not too sure about mixing, you know, religion and state. It doesn't seem to be working too good uh, for them. But I think it's important for us to realize that the religion that the, informed the conscience of our founding fathers wasn't just religion generally, it was Christianity specifically. Take a look at a few quotes from our founders. John Adams and John Hancock said this, we recognize no sovereign but God and no king but Jesus. Patrick Henry said, this nation was founded not by religionists but by Christians, not on religion but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Noah Webster said, the Christian religion in its purity is the basis or rather the source for all genuine freedom in government. And I am persuaded that no civil government of a republican form can exist and be durable in which the principles of that religion have not a controlling influence. See, that's the way that the founders talked about God. And we're, we get uncomfortable with that, right? We don't want to make people uncomfortable. You know, we got separation of church and state and all the ways has that been applied. But friends, our founders would have no concept of the idea of the separation of church and state the way it's been applied today. They would say, of course Christian people are going to have an influence on government. That's what the whole thing was built around. Of course, when Jefferson penned that phrase, separation of church and state, it was written to a church group assuring them that the government was going to not have any influence on the church, not the other way around. So they would have no idea, no framework to even put the idea of that Christians and the church would not influence the government. That was what the whole thing was built upon. But we've pushed God to the margins and when we've done that, we've weakened our national conscience. And when we do that, that means that law has to replace conscience and things um, are kind of go downhill from there. Now, that was kind of a summary of what we talked about last week. That's how I see what is going on. 
But today we're going to look at why that's happened. Why is it that we've pushed God to the margins of our national conversation? It may not be what you think, or at least my idea might not be what, what you think. I believe that the main reason why we've pushed God to the side is because of our wealth. It's because we're so affluent. The more wealthy we are, the less dependent we become on God. Jesus said that, the Proverbs said that, that the more wealthy we become, the harder it is for us to depend upon God. In fact, the, the Proverbs uh, writer um, tells us that by eliminating God from the conversation, we can no longer recognize and acknowledge who gave us the gifts in the first place. And if we can't give God the credit, then what happens? Then we take the credit. And if we take the credit, then we become arrogant. And so prosperity without gratitude makes us arrogant. Being rich as we are as Americans without gratitude, without acknowledging God and th that he was the source of all those makes us arrogant. And what's the number one complaint that most people from all around the world have about Americans? It's that we're arrogant, right, why? Because we've been blessed incredibly so, but we take it and we assume and act as if it was our own doing and not the hand of God, and not the blessing of God, and so that makes us seem arrogant. The Proverbs writer was afraid of that in his own life. In fact, he had this prayer that we should all adopt as our own prayer in Proverbs chapter 30, <clears throat> verses 8 and 9. He said this, Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, Who is the Lord? If I have too much, I might say, Who is the Lord? See, I think the reason we've moved God out of the spotlight is because we've been blessed so much by the God that we pushed into this, out of the spotlight. And increasingly, as individuals and as a nation, we are saying, who is the Lord? Who is the Lord? Now, just before Moses led, or he brought the children of Israel into the promised land, but he led them up to the cusp of that, and just before they were gonna go in, he kinda gave them a pep talk. He kinda gave them actually a warning talk letting them know what was going to happen, but giving them, um, kind of painting uh, a picture for them of what might happen, and he was warning them against it. And though he wrote it a few thousand years ago to the people of Israel who were about to go into the promised land, it is so relevant. As we, as we read through it, it's just so relevant what he's saying. It could have been written to our founders 240 years ago, 250 years ago, 200 years ago, to the people of America. In fact, I think it has incredible application for us even today. We're going to be looking in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn to Deuteronomy chapter 8. And uh, the story is in that whole um, book, but we're just going to look at a few uh, verses, beginning with verse 6. This is what he, he says to the people before they're going into this new land. He says, observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in obedience to him and re revering him. This is the first thing he says. He says, all right, guys, you're about to go into a new place. Two important things, all right? God's law and revering him, okay? Revering God's law and having an awe of who he is. There was a connection between those two. See, he knew that in this new system that God was going to establish, there was going to be no king, all right? The people, their conscience was going to be informed by the law that God had given them, but by also their awe and their reverence and their respect for and their realizing that they were accountable to God. He knew that those two things had to go together. See, God knew, uh, or God was going to give them this incredible set of laws, but he knew that wasn't going to be enough. He knew that if they just had the law without revering him, without having this fear of him, and understanding that they were, at the end of the day, accountable to him, that it wasn't going to work. And our founders of this country understood that as well. If you read their writings, you see that that's true. John Adams, for example, said, We have no government armed in power, capable of contending with human passions, unbridled by morality and religion. Our constitution was made only for a religious and moral people. It is wholly inadequate for the government of any other. The, our founders realized that they were going to come up with these great laws and this great this, uh, framework, but if people lost their awe of God, and when the founders used the word religion, again, they're, they're meaning specifically Christianity, they realized that if people lost that awe of God, if they lost their sense of accountability to God, that no framework of government, as good as it was, could work. And that's what Moses was telling the people. Verse 7, he says, For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. And then he goes to describe how good it is. A land with brooks and streams and, 
deep springs gushing out into valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce. And get this, you will lack for nothing. Sounds pretty good. A land where rocks are iron and and you can dig copper out of the hills. Moses said, this is going to be an incredible place that God's going to bring you to. You're not going to lack for anything. And so, verse 10, when you have eaten and are satisfied, then praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. When you get there and it's so good, remember to recognize where those good things come from. Remember to honor God and to respect him. Remember to be gratitude, to give gratitude to him. And that's why it's so dangerous for any nation to push God to the the sideline because then we lose the ability to acknowledge where the blessings come from. If we can't talk openly about God, then we can't acknowledge the blessings that he has given us. And that's exactly what Moses was warning the people about. If we don't express our thanks, again, we forget, and then we start to take the credit. Verse 11, be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I am giving you this day. Why do you have to tell him to remember? Why did he have to tell him? Because it's human nature to forget. That's why. Anybody living testimony to that? All right, we, we just forget. And he says, when that happens, don't forget. Remember. Remember who brought you there. Because again, prosperity and the blessings that you're going to have, he says, they're not conducive to humility. They're not conducive to gratitude. They're conducive to arrogance because you're going to think and you're going to forget who gave them to you and you're going to think that it was you. Things are going to go so good for you, he says, that one day you're going to wake up and you're going to say, who who is the Lord? Who is the Lord? He continues on, verse 12. Otherwise, he says, when you eat and are satisfied, and when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large, and your silver and gold increase, and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud, and you will forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt and out of the land of slavery. He said, there's a danger here when everything is going so good that you'll forget. Now, If he was writing that, if Moses was writing that 250 years ago or 200 years ago or yesterday to us, he might say, when you have nice houses and two cars and a garage with so much stuff in it that you can't even fit your cars in there, right? When you have flat screens and smartphones and Blu-rays and when the stock market's up, the tendency is that you will become proud and you'll forget the Lord your God who brought you out of England, the land of taxation without representation. Right? It fits right in there. Okay? This is so relevant that it could have been today. He says, verse 17, You may say to yourself, My power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. Danger will be to think that you pulled this off yourself. That you, in the very American of terms, pulled yourself up by your own bootstraps. And you made it happen. And that'll be the the danger. See, the danger with my hands and my strength caused my wealth is what? When it's mine, I'm not accountable to anybody for it. I can do whatever I want to because I'm accountable only to me. And we think we're unaccountable. We do whatever we think we can get away with. We become more and more unjust and negative things come in. You see, capitalism is great as the founders established our system and it's Uh, serve to reduce more poverty and alleviate all kinds of things all over the world for the last couple hundred years but that's only when it's undergirded by the morality of the conscience that's geared toward God see when you take God out of the picture then capitalism just becomes a mechanism for greed it just becomes a mechanism to for injustice and our founders knew that and they said if you ever take God out of the picture this system is not going to work And that's what I think you've seen. And so when the system starts to break down, then more laws have to be enacted to keep people from being greedy and for keep injustice to happen. And then more and more laws determine what's right instead of conscience. And that's kind of the situation that we find ourselves. Our system, the problem isn't the system. It's us as a nation saying, who is the Lord? Who is the Lord? See, everything's wonderful till we factor God out. Verse 18. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. He said, when you you get in there, remember, it was God that gave you 
all that stuff, and he gave you the ability. That's true for all of us, isn't it? I mean, we have what we have because we've earned it, but we've earned it because people have taught us or helped us or because of the gifts and abilities that God has given us and allowed us to do. We as Americans, more than anybody, should understand this, that God is... uh, responsible for our blessings. I mean, what did we as Americans, what did our founders have to do with the huge oceans that are, were our borders, that more than anything co- allowed the extensive period of peace that after, the, after the Revolutionary War that allowed growth and invention and wealth to accumulate? What did we have to do with those oceans? We didn't put them there, right? What did we have to do with all the natural resources that our uh, great country has? What did we have to do with that? Our, Focus should be on gratitude, understanding that all of those things came from God. Gratitude makes us generous and humble instead of arrogant and proud. See, if you take God out of the equation, then humility and gratitude and accountability, they all go out with him quickly as well. And here comes the warning, verse 19. If you ever forget the Lord your God, and again, he's talking not just to individuals, but to a whole nation. If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed. At which point we say, whew, I'm glad we're not Israel. All right, they have that special deal going with God. That, you know, we don't have to worry about that. Except for he's not done. Take a look at verse 20. Like the nations the Lord destroyed before you, so you will be destroyed for not obeying the Lord your God. Does that mean God is actively destroying and building nations today? I don't know. Does that mean what we are looking at and kind of the dysfunction of our culture, does that mean that's God's judgment? I don't know. Maybe arrogance, maybe pushing God to the side has its own consequences. Maybe ignoring the voice of wisdom for such a long time has its own consequences. Maybe ignoring God has its own consequences that he doesn't even have to actively judge. I don't know. But I know it's a scary spot to be in because increasingly we are a nation that's saying, who is the Lord? Who is the Lord? See, the the thing is, it doesn't have to be that way. In fact, it wasn't always that way. In fact, just very recently has it become that way. Some of you may be old enough to remember in spring of 1944, everybody in America knew that at some point that we were going to invade Europe and do that. Nobody knew when or where, but everybody kind of anticipated it was coming, and it was a time of great anxiety uh, in the country. That day finally came on June the 6th, 1944, D-Day, what we call it, and on that day, Franklin Roosevelt, the president, used the power of radio to kind of link into the country and link in people and all that anxiety and and things together in a way that hadn't been done maybe before and he did it through prayer. Throughout that day the network broadcast the text of his prayer, it was printed in the afternoon newspapers. At 2200 Eastern wartime the president prayed while Americans across the country joined him and this was his prayer. Okay, in case you were here last week and this was the last time an American president had a prayer published. This was his prayer. Almighty God Our sons, pride of our nation, this day have set up a mighty endeavor. Lead them straight and true. Give strength to their arms, stoutness to their hearts, steadfastness in their faith. These men are lately drawn from the ways of peace. They fight not for the lust of conquest. They fight to end conquest. They fight to liberate. They yearn for the end of battle, for their return to the haven of home. Some will never return. Embrace these, Father, and receive them, thy, her- the, thy heroic servants, into thy kingdom. And, O Lord, give us faith. Give us faith in thee, faith in our sons, faith in each other. Thy will be done, Almighty God. Amen. What happened spontaneously in the nation during that invasion was incredible. The nation came together in prayer. The New York Daily News pulled its lead articles and printed in their place the Lord's Prayer. The New York Times had editorials calling people to pray. Lord and Taylor, the huge department store, didn't even open that day. Their president sent all 3,000 of their employees home so that they could pray. The New York Stock Exchange was closed for two minutes for a time of prayer. Special services were had in churches everywhere. Entire cities came to a complete stop 
so that people could pray. In spite of everything that had transpired in the country, there was still a strong national conscience. People still realized that we needed God, that there was still a God that we were accountable to, and at the end of the day, we're dependent upon for anything that good to happen, especially in an endeavor like that. Of course, there was some pushback. There was some, you know, people that didn't like it, but that was largely overcome and, and overlooked. It was very insensitive to the atheists, right, that we would pray like that as a nation, but there was no national church established. It was just people tapping into this national conscience, the idea that was still shared by a vast majority of the people in our country that there was a God in heaven to whom we were accountable to, that we were, should be grateful to, and that whom we were dependent upon. And it's a good thing that they didn't push God out of the conversation because the very next big thing in our country's life was fueled by a mixture of God and government. And it was led by a pastor. You see, before he was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he was Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. And he, through the, in the civil rights movement, called on the nation's conscience. Right? He said that things, were, the laws were unjust. What would he base that upon? The law? No. He was basing it on something greater. He was basing it on the appeal to people's conscience. In his famous I Have a Dream speech, yes, he quoted from Scripture, but it was the statement from the Declaration of, that was, uh, Declaration of Independence that was like a compass that brought him back, and he quoted from it. He said, I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. And then he quoted... We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. And then he ended that famous speech with a quote from a famous Negro spiritual that said, free at last, free at last, were the next three words, you know them. Thank God Almighty, free at last. See, he was tapping into what was still a strong national conscience at that time. He was calling people to something greater beyond them, their accountability to God and their divinely informed conscience. And that created leverage for him. But in, that, in the time since then, our national conscience has greatly eroded. Oh yeah, we still have hints and peaks and glimmers. If you remember back on 9-11, um, 2001, right after that happened, I mean, people flooded to churches. If you remember, the next couple of weeks, churches were packed and people were looking to God and looking for answers. That was 15 years ago. Now, for the most part, appeals to God are, are openly ridiculed, right? I'm sure you remember back just in December the 2nd of last year, two gunmen went into a center for the development, developmentally disabled in San Bernardino, California, right? Gunned down 14 people, injured 17 others, you know, in the name and for the sake of uh, Islam, they said. In the immediate aftermath from that, several prominent uh, politicians and other people, you know, tweeted out and, and spoke in terms of offering prayers for the families of those victims, offering condolences and, and, and well wishes and specifically prayers, thinking, again, tapping into that what used to be national conscience. But the very next morning, the New York Daily News offered this headline. I think we've got it up there for you. With the, the tweets from several prominent uh, politicians on there asking for prayers for the victims, their response, God isn't fixing this. God isn't fixing this. Now, friends, I don't care what your politics are. I don't care what you think about gun control or Islam or any of the things that are going on. But friends, if God doesn't fix this, it ain't going to get fixed, right? We're foolish to think that we and the people that we elect can fix it when we and the people we elected are the ones that have broken it, right? We are the ones that have, have messed things up. And so now, more than ever, we need God to step in to fix things. The good news is this. Some 2,000 years ago, God did step into the picture through the person of Jesus Christ. He stepped onto our planet to fix things that we had broken, to bring light where there was darkness, to bring healing where there was sickness, to bring uh, beauty from ashes, to bring life from death. And the good news for us, some 240 years ago, a group of men founded an entire nation based on accountability to and gratitude to that same creator God who stepped into that creation as Jesus. So no, we don't want a theocracy. We don't want that. 
But we want a country to be governed by laws but, and by people who understand that those laws aren't enough. That along with those laws, there have to be an accountability, a reverence, an awe of who God is, and a remembrance of who God is, and that He was the one that all our blessings have come from. You see, if you erase God from the national conversation, then we have nobody to be grateful to except for ourselves, and we become arrogant. If you erase God from the national conversation, then we have nobody to be accountable to except to ourselves, and then everybody does what's right in their own eyes. If we eliminate God from the conversation, then we detach our conscience from our, from our policies. And that's what you see happening. Our rights and our responsibilities are no longer tempered by that fear of God that the founder said was so absolutely crucial. So I said, as I said last week, it all has to start with us. Take a look at 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 where God says to his people, if my people, that's us, who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. So the question really is, it's not for the the culture, it's not for the politicians, it's not for the people out there, it's for us. And the question is this, are we personally living in gratitude and accountability to God? Are you? Am I? Are we daily humbling ourselves before God, acknowledging that He's where all the the blessings have come from, acknowledging that we are dependent upon Him, acknowledging that we are accountable to Him, repenting of our sins, begging for His intervention in our country? Are we doing that as a people? You see, God has been a central part of the creation and the establishment and the life of this nation. Friends, let's boldly invite him back into that conversation. Because Abraham Lincoln said, nations are only blessed whose God is the Lord. Friends, I believe that to be true. Would you pray with me? God, thank you so much for how much you love us. That you did step into history in the form of Jesus Christ to set things right. God, I thank you for the brave men and women some 240 plus years ago who acknowledged you, acknowledged your role and your sovereignty and established a nation under those very principles. God, I thank you for the men and women who have since died to uphold the freedom that we have that those men and women established. God, I pray that we would as a church, as individual people, not push you to the edge of our lives, but that we would invite you into the center of our lives. God, that that we, as we sang earlier, that we would be a generation that seeks you. So God, my prayer is that you would give us all clean hands, that you would give us pure hearts. God, we need you now more than ever. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks for taking the time to check out our website and watch the message today. Um, It's my hope and prayer that today's message will have encouraged you and challenged you as you try to take your next steps toward God. If you have questions about today's message or would just like to talk to someone about what it means to take your next steps toward God, I'd be happy to talk with you. You can reach me at uh, the email address or the phone number on your screen. Otherwise, thanks for watching and may God richly bless you.